help me with the slides because uh, she has the yes she has the uh, the slides I couldn't connect properly so um, what I'd like to do today is to speak a little bit from my heart about why we do this and what we do and how we do it and there are some case studies that I would like to discuss and we at the end we will flash through them and I have some truly humbling, sobering, and some of them truly ridiculous anecdotes uh, as I was trying to bring two distinct uh, contradictory cultures together to create value. So uh, food for thought is the purpose of this. So I hope some of the concept that I will flash, I may not be able to talk about them, will uh, uh, help with our uh, discussion at the end. So next slide, please. What I like to do is I like to uh, sort of confess that I changed the title a little bit as soon as I hit the, um, the first page because I realized that the presentation that I had prepared for March 16 actually would work for us. But the key thing is that at the time uh, in February 2020, we lived, this was ages ago, remember? We lived in a different planet. It was a time of innocence. We absolutely had no uh, inklings of what was going to happen. So what I had given to Danuta is the proposed abstract, and I'm going to read the abstract. I, this is a February 25, and I kept it here. Of course, such relational language typically get taken out of abstracts. It says, all enduring relationships are cultivated over time, nourished by mutual understanding, respect, and mutual value creation. And that's the operative word here, that engender trust among the partners, university, industry, research partnerships, relations are no exception, I see. So you did not see that part of the abstract. Uh, the abstract that was given to you though, I added to it a little bit because of the new planet where we descended, sort of demands that we add and think deep, deeper about the uh, first principles. I say, I will uh, uh, share in this talk insights that I gained over many years of personal experience in the trenches to build research and innovation bridges between academia and industry, locally, regionally, and globally to better serve our students. And that's another operative that we have here. Then I promise to share uh, case studies that help us maintain, not only initiate, maintain, but grow long-lasting, peer-to-peer organic partnerships that are robust enough to navigate, as if I know, ever-changing, I added social and economic, industrial, corporate, political, and global landscape. I wasn't thinking social and economic at the time. I was being a bit transactional. So, uh, next slide, please. In the previous slide, you saw a, the picture of a flower. There was a time uh, when we looked at those flowers and never saw a corona. But in the last three months, everywhere we look, we see this new guest on our planet. And I hope that what I'm able to convey today that this pandemic will serve in my judgment as an agent for transformation. Next slide, please. Obviously, we are facing tremendous health and economic challenges. Next, please. And we are edging toward a time of unrest because we have reset. We have reset, but we are, next slide, please, in an amazing point in the, on the planet. As a person I see, uh, Yuri in our audience, he's like me too. He's all over the world. I bet you would agree with me that this is the city you want to be. And I'd like to explain why I say this. Obviously, Philadelphia is the city of first. And not only 
is a city of first, but this is where industrial revolution in America's kicked off in 1750s. And we became literally the innovation industry entrepreneurship uh, center of the world. We lost that edge, but we never gave up on what we cared about, which was the universities, the health uh, industries. Hence, we became a true, truly a branded city as education and medicine city. Wherever you go in the world, if they know something about Philadelphia, they say Edmet City. But the key thing that we've been able to do, because since we are the city of the first, first hospital, first university, first everything, first pharmaceuticals, and uh, after the pharmaceutical industries, biopharma, biotech, and biomedical technologies, these are all the strategic life sciences industries that we need, need to mount this, uh, uh, overcome this, cha uh, this, this challenge. So let's go to the next slide, please. So if you look to Philadelphia and um, you accept the fact that since mid-2000, uh, in the first decade, middle, when our, uh, uh, we uh, in Philadelphia rethought Philadelphia, and I have a very interesting uh, old banner that I found from 2006. It was a technology showcase that we were uh, celebrating. Uh, this is November, probably it was Entrepreneurship Week. And we said, rethinking Philadelphia, reinventing Philadelphia, and action now. And we said, it all began here. So when you look to Philadelphia, you find this amazing cluster of fantastic academic institutions. And many of them, like Dress Drexel, uh, within and also amongst them, uh, uh, share, participate, uh, and oftentimes join forces. So the concept of one university, which was uh, the main topic of our strategic plan, the, uh, the previous strategic plan, and now more recently at Drexel, we have a very special, unique construct that's emerging. This is from the president's office and the provost's office. This is what's called Solutions Institute. Uh, it is supposed to bring this concept of oneness, the interdisciplinary, the intercultural, interinstitutional, international, whichever inter uh, um, that we want to um, mention about us, uh, Drexel and uh, other universities in Philadelphia, but certainly that uh, institute is to become the hub of uh, our activities at Drexel. So I put the plug here for those of you who may not know, Please find out more about this. It's very easy to go to the website. It got launched recently, and I have a lot of hopes about what it can do. Indeed, when you look in the region, uh, our hospitals, our medical research centers, our economic development agencies, we have now science parks, incubators. Uh, I mentioned about the amazing industry base that we have that is perfect for these times the business, legal, and investment community, of course, always are wonderful alumni, and all those friends uh, who, out of the kindness of their hearts, helped us. And I saw um, Maggie in the audience. She was one of the founders of our school. I will say a few things about the school also. The city of Philadelphia knows us and cares about us. So does state of Pennsylvania that funded a lot of our translational activities early on and the federal office. So, so we are, we are, well, I like you to accept the fact that we are absolutely in the right place at this time of perhaps challenge, but those of us who have, uh, who see the light at the, on the tunnel know that this is the place to be and this is the place to make a difference. Uh, next slide, please. So a city of first typically engenders other firsts. Uh, we have at Drexel, for those who are not familiar with the School of Biomedical Engineering, a school that is totally 
created out of the liberal love and risk taking of uh, a small number of faculty who basically were led, inspired by our students, women engineering students, who wanted us to create after many, many years of uh, um, running an institute, Biomedical Engineering and Science Institute uh, uh, that was founded in 1958. And my advisor, who uh, Herman Schwann, who founded the first ever biomedical engineering department out of this medical electronics uh, program where I was doing my PhD. So I ended up with one of the first PhDs in this field. So they all prepared the, uh, the uh, backdrop for us to create this school that we dedicated those of us who uh, strategized. And uh, this was a mid nineties. Uh, we uh, strategized toward the end of the nineties. We uh, finished our strategies. Our strategic plan is actually in front of you. That's on the banner. We dedicated the school to life-saving solutions that would provide educational experiences for our students. We committed ourselves to work with our local and global partners, and we wanted to join forces with them to move our discoveries from the laboratory to healthcare. Eventually, uh, this uh, spirit obviously made us become a national uh, best practice. And because the School of Biomedical Engineering is at the level of the university, it is mandated to bring opportunities to the university and work at the university level. Hence, this cultural endowment come, came uh, eventually. Uh, our curriculum also, I don't want to go into the details, at the time when it was conceived, this banner probably is early 2000s. Uh, uh, if you look at all the strategic thrusts in terms of uh, bioinformatics, which has become personalized medicine, neuroengineering, which has become cognitive neuroengineering, tissue engineering, which has become uh, um, the uh, regenerative engineering. And at the cross section, we have these amazing works that our faculty and their partners in various departments, various schools, and various institutions in the region and nationally, uh, drug delivery, and uh, more recently, we are pushing immune engineering. And I don't know any other field, immune sciences and engineering, immune modulation, any other topic that is, is relevant to today. So uh, many people who know about the school find, find out what we've done. They, they tell me, and I sort of remember how we used to think how precise that school was. So that's another good reason that I think I had the opportunity to speak about uh, uh, with you today in order to see how we can now um, live up to this amazing promise that we have. So next slide, please. So this is, my, uh, actually I have two major slides. That was uh, basically uh, framing the conversation. Um, I quietly changed the title to innovation partnerships because after all, uh, innovation is what comes out of a knowledge enterprise. Uh, we have to ask ourselves why we do this. In order to answer this, we have to look at why we exist. What is our academic value proposition? We are a knowledge, creativity, scholarship enterprise. That's what we are. And we are here because we are not only to preserve and to transfer that humanity's knowledge base and do this through ex discovery, exploration, open-ended endeavors, take, I said here, the road less traveled, take academic risks, which are very unlike commercial risks that I'd like to mention a little bit. We are in the business of talent development. This is our goods. So we do partner with any other stakeholder because it's good for our students, it's good for our university, and because it will be long lasting. The key thing in here is that we do not just preserve and transfer this knowledge base, we add to it, we enrich it, enrich it through research. Obviously, this is a huge big domain. I'm going to focus only what I know what to do, which is scientific research that leads 
into technology development. And you see, uh, in among the technology development, I have identified high tech, which is typically Silicon Valley type of stuff, hard tech, more the industrial base that we have, the steel industry, materials industry, and then deep tech, uh, deep tech that is more the life based the, uh, the 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 technologies that truly takes years to invest and work on before truly it creates the value high risk high reward kind of um, things so we serve society with these in order to serve society we can help our profession uh, we can do some good uh, social good uh, social entrepreneurship maybe but we certainly can add value to economy. And that's what I like to focus. That's why I made them all red. So this is why we do this. And now let's look at this uh, duality diagram or yin yang diagram. Uh, I'm assuming that we are the white group. We are with industry uh, in a dual complementary uh, sort of set up where we together can innovate. Therefore, all everything that we do in order to enrich the, our students' experience, our ability to add to the science and technology base, we have to think of stakeholders for whom, with whom we can create value. So hence mutual value creation and there are partnership models. So let's go to the next slide. When we claim that we are going to now join forces with industry, we have to truly understand uh, what do they stand for. I have to given to you because I have specialized to innovation basically, technology innovation. Uh, this is the journey is from an um, uh, infographic published by one of the com uh, uh, wonderful companies um, in uh, Virginia, uh, it sort of depicts the journey from concept to commercial. So this very long, arduous journey. And if you look at the bottom of your screen, you see a nebulous, chaotic maybe place where the university truly uh, upstream creates the ideas, creates the uh, proofs of concepts, research happens, preclinical uh, studies are done, publications, thesis, degrees, patents, and we basically are the, on the inspiration side of this journey. The perspiration side of the journey, which is uh, like Edison, <laughs> it's 1% almost, if it's not, maybe a few more percent more, but real perspiration happens when this idea, when this concept, this proof of concept that we have demonstrated to have promised in our lab moves and goes through this amazing pathway in industry. In order for us to be able to partner and to create value together, we must understand our partner and they should too. So let's go to the next slide. So in this slide, I have basically taken back the yin and yang uh, graphic, but I have added a lot to it. You even see Drexel Solutions Institute, you see translational research, you see where you, uh, these, these um, new add-ons, the co-op, you see when industry exists within us, which means part of our education, we, uh, create uh, the next generation uh, and help them develop through cooperative experiences. We do translational research. We basically integrate ourselves in order to be able to create mutual value, not only in terms of talent, but also in terms of technology innovation. We have technology commercialization offices. We do sponsored research agreements. So we have created a construct where the industry partnership, although industry is culturally so distinct from us, remember our chaotic open-ended discovery exploration based enterprise. And then we enter in another world 
where organizational structure, professional discipline, bottom line culture, and certainly commercial risk, which is very distinct from the academic risk. So we, if we come up with models to work together, these models must uh, negotiate, must reconcile different cultures, the way we think we're not bottom line, we're not professionally disciplined for to produce a product, a process or a service. We're not for profits, we're for nonprofit, we're supposed to share our knowledge. So in a way, two immiscible cultures, in order to come together, we must make sure that the, they not only like to work with each other, respect each other, care for each other, join in the same purpose, in the same mission, but also they must negotiate their risk perceptions. Our risk perception in academia and risk perception in industry are so absolutely contrary to each other. So what we should do, we should go to the next slide. Yes, uh, this is a very, very old slide. This is the day I woke up to this reality. On the left side, you see academic value creation. We create at, univer at universities amazing academic value. We write papers, we um, graduate thesis, we uh, give conferred degrees, we work on laboratory prototypes, on proofs of concepts, and we typically protect our rights, uh, intellectual property rights. This creates academic value, amazing academic value, and because that also creates at the same time talent. But when you look at the red curve, the, this curve is zero. There is no commercial value in anything that we do at the university in this context. The commercial value starts accumulating as soon as we take uh, that um, laboratory proof of concept to the field, develop a prototype that will be probably tested, validated. We work on a business proof of concept. We look at commercialized uh, commercial viability, marketability, manufacturability, reimbursement, uh, um, uh, regulatory pathway. Uh, will it uh, be um, the uh, will US be the right market? Is there somewhere else that we could do? Who should I partner with? All these discussions and resolutions basically help us cross what uh, cliche says. Uh, the value of death, which I call translation research gap. So if we stay separate, we oftentimes shelve a lot of the wonderful ideas that we worked on with our brilliant students. Uh, we absolutely have infinite commercial risk in academia. So what the concept is, and this is what we began with the School of Biomedical Engineering and other partners at uh, Drexel, uh, basically uh, uh, reinforced uh, this um, approach. And eventually we discovered partners uh, such as Coulter Foundation that I'll say a few things about. But the way we did it is we brought in the, the world, this world where commercial risk is abated. If you look uh, now at the axis, it says, risk reduction timeline. So at the university, we do not reduce risk, but uh, next click, please. If we bring that world into us, and there is this beautiful concept that close school uh, of entrepreneurship faculty colleagues uh, uh, often uh, repeat, and which I totally believe, this is a safe harbor, fail early, fail safe. So not only our students, uh, the, they get ex extraordinary experiences, but our faculty also get exposed to this partnership where risks are, commercial risks are reduced. In any case, the, what, uh, this, one, this is one model. Uh, there are quite a few models. If we go to the next uh, slide, please. Uh, and one of them is Wallace H. Coulter Foundation model. 
uh, this is uh, the model that truly uh, uh, engaged me because this is why we had created the school uh, in a way. Uh, in, uh, this, was, this was such an alignment of uh, vision, such an alignment of mission. The World Stage Culture Foundation, this is early 2000s, they were just thinking about uh, how to uh, invest uh, the wealth uh, of Wolves H. Coulter, uh, the founder of Coulter uh, Corporation, that is not uh, Bickman Coulter. Those of you who are in um, uh, chemistry, biochemistry, know about the uh, Culture counter, but also there are many, many other uh, extraordinary uh, innovations uh, that this man, who was an engineer, who was an inventor, he was an entrepreneur, but more so, he was a visionary. He, uh, though I never knew him, uh, when I discovered about him, uh, I totally remember thinking that uh, Professor uh, H. H. Sun, who founded our institute, and then uh, um, we, uh, that we transformed into a school, he was absolutely of the same mind. They both believe that sci science serves humanity, and this is powered by the diversity of world cultures. He has a very, very interesting uh, life story, if you want to know, but the key thing is that what Wallace H. Culture Foundation did, it's not anything like any other uh, technology commercialization or technology transfer program. This is a unique academic innovation program that is trusted with the biomedical engineering faculty at the universities where they form their partnership. And it is about academic culture change. It's about the next generation of biomedical engineers who will be cultivated in the image of such luminaries such as Wallace H. Coulter, H.H. Uh, H. Sun, and many others who have broken many pathways. So what happened is that in the, the program was launched in 2005. Our school was already five, six years old. And we absolutely at the university did not have a technology transfer office or anything like that. And all the big ones, Stanford's, Duke, Michigan's, Johns Hopkins, Penn's uh, of this world, MIT's, got into the uh, competition and out of the 80 such schools, amazing schools, we ended up because of our spirit, our soul, our alumni, our friends, the industry partners, the economic development partners, the city partners, Penn came to support us when they couldn't pass through the first few rounds, then they came to support us. The state of Pennsylvania, everybody came through and we ended up with an endowment. Um, uh, this was 2011. We started the program uh, receiving yearly funds in uh, 2006. So this for me was truly a uh, model that made me now take it up globally. That's why now we are working on a global innovation program and this program is about, uh, by the way, in the endowment agreement, there is a clause, uh, you will do ambassadorship uh, globally. So I took this upon myself and I have been socializing and uh, inspiring uh, with our experiences, not necessarily telling them what to do, mostly in China, but certainly in Turkey, my home country, and it took off. It is so amazing and I'm very happy to tell you in the last two, three months that we have been in the pandemic mode. I work day and night and our times are very uh, bizarre. Uh, uh, seven hours behind um, uh, Turkey and 12 hours behind China. And we have been working in the trenches using the same principles that this uh, amazing program literally uh, made us uh, experiment with. Uh, we became very confident that we can take a concept to commercialization in any environment as long as we follow a certain commercialization discipline. 
And this was done without any interference with our academic mission. It, it is instead enriching our academic mission. Uh, I listed also the other schools that are in the group. The red ones are the ones that are in doubt. So let's move to the next slide, please. Now we're done. Uh, I would like to end here, but before I end, I'd like to flash through uh, in case uh, there are questions about stories, uh, such programs created such amazing partnerships, the startup uh, that called InfraScan that develops a first-in-class standard setting point of care hematoma detector handheld. Uh, it's like your phone actually, but we know that you're bleeding in your head uh, and the technology is now all over the world in so many countries that we cannot count anymore. It uses a technology developed in our lab, so it's a spin-off basically. The next one, please. I'd like to, if you ask me, tell you about this other truly extraordinary experience partnering, ganging up almost. At the same time that we were creating the school, uh, we ganged up with Exponents Philadelphia branch that was also getting off the ground. And you see Steve Kurtz, he's also a faculty with us because this is a uh, company that is about concept of commercialization, uh, works with all the industries, this one especially biomedical, and we have so many co-ops every year with them, we have so many theses with them, PhD students, uh, Ryan Siski, I put here, he's an alumnus, uh, a very large number of our students who work with them, starting with a STAR project, they will continue during their co-ops, they do their thesis sometimes, sometimes they do PhD or they go elsewhere, but regardless, this is such an amazingly organic peer-to-peer -peer relationship. And some of their stuff also is uh, uh, academic type of stuff are also on our faculty. Next slide, Pete, please. This is not anything uh, that you can read or you can understand. This is again to help you with a conversation. When you uh, are intrigued, even mystified, or sometimes uh, you hear myths about things, uh, you may accept them. In my case, I always jump into the fire and I try to do it myself. And because I have done so many unexpected things, also globally, not only uh, in, uh, in US, that also very uh, humbling, sobering, sometimes humiliating experiences uh, happen. I have many, many anecdotes. This is, if we go to the next slide, this is all Turkish. I'm receiving an award, by the way, at this amazing city in Turkey, uh, in the central Turkey. It's in, uh, well, uh, it's called Kayseri. This city is most entrepreneurial city, all the wealthy, big industry people come from there for some reason. So they are uh, hosting this conference, the, um, the whole countrywide university industry partnership conference, and they are giving me their annual honor uh, award, whatever. So they asked me uh, for a presentation. And if you ask me, I will tell you what happened afterwards. And I had to accept an award after uh, uh, that sort of humbling, embarrassing experience. In any case, this is the end. This was flashed in order to invite some conversation. So what I'd like to say in the last slide is that I'd like to thank you for taking time on such a beautiful day. It's absolutely gorgeous outside, if you have noticed, if you work too hard. I hope that I was able to uh, sort of compress uh, decades, at least 25 years of experience, and what I have uh, retained and what I wanted to share with you. We truly, any in any of our activities, any of our partnership, any of our efforts, it's about the academic mission. It's about our preserving the knowledge base, transferring the knowledge base, adding to the knowledge base, and if industry, can help us do a much better job. We have to work with them, find a way to work with them. I gave you some examples and there are many, many other examples. Hence, I like to toast 
again to health, life, justice, and equity. And I know we shall overcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Banu. Um, we do have some time for conversation and questions. Um, and you're getting your appropriate applause and, and the like, if those of you would like to add to that in, <laughs> in our sides. Um, I'm trying to think how we can best manage our, our question things. If people could either put their hand up or we can scan to seeing you. If you just raise your hand so that we're not all talking the same, we'll, we'll go through and uh, unmute you or you'll unmute yourself to start conversation for a few minutes and then we'll do a, a last breakout. Does anybody want to start? Banu, Drexel was founded on cooperative education and you've yes. taken it to a new degree. Thank you. So kind of you. Actually, I put that in one of the slides, if you notice, Dick. I noticed because it. Because that is talent creation. And yes. we do it with our partners. And we do it well. Bonner, do you want to mention a little bit about the, the partnership with Shanghai Jiao Tung and how that is global innovation partnership? Yes, yes, there's so much going on. Uh, oh, of course, I would love to mention the fact that whatever we've done at the school, uh, and whatever we've done at Rexel in, uh, in the region, we were also able to share it with our partners. So we have uh, in China, two very special partners, Shanghai Jatong University. By the way, uh, through this kind of partnership, we recently uh, um, uh, graduated our third dual PhD student, which is uh, we, uh, he's doing, Adrian Curtin is going to receive the best dissertation award. Let me brag a little bit, put a plug uh, for what happens. But because we find absolutely the best partner wherever they are, uh, in my case, I look very closely to China and to Turkey uh, because I have the history about this. Uh, we obviously have done the conventional, the, the that's sort of what is expected with Shanghai Jatong. But Shanghai Tech, which was created, and we were part of the creation uh, when it was only Shanghai Advanced Research Institute, and uh, I, uh, Yuri, among us, knows very well the history. Now this is a full-fledged university, and we are working with them to create not only some uh, academic um, enterprise uh, inspired by what we've done, but a lot better, hopefully. And this is, uh, the Shanghai Tech is in the Zhangjiang High Tech Park, an amazing place. And it is uh, in the process of uh, um, engaging in biomedical innovation. So uh, uh, Paul, there's so much to say, so maybe I should not talk more. Maybe we have another opportunity. I see we have a question from Jay, Jay Bot, the library. Yes. Uh, hi, Banu. What a wonderful presentation. I'm really inspired. You're always encouraging. My question is, you talk about university uh, innovation, industry partnerships. Yes. Uh, what will be the role of libraries into that? How do we uh, support your mission and uh, what? Uh, how do we all work together in that sense? Uh, Jay, you know uh, what I'm going to say, so you want me to put a plug for the library. Uh, you know this. I always say this, the library is the heart and the brain. You are our learning partners, our discovery partners. So uh, I cannot imagine a university that is not centered in what is called library, which is actually learning partnership, discovery partnership. So library is the essence of what we now call university, but moving forward, we may actually uh, evolve even more to have the library, the learning, the discovery, a partner to us uh, at the center of gravity of what, whatever we do. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Sure, Jim. Yeah. So, Banu, uh, one of the things <coughs> that you sometimes see, say, between a, an industrial 
or, or foundation funding versus government funding is this big uh, gap between uh, indirect costs. And I wonder, uh, could you give us, how have you been able to negotiate that um, trough, so to speak? Yes, there's a very, very good question because I have not talked about the transactional aspects. I've talked more about the relational aspects, which is very important, but transactional, the operational, the implementation side of things make things happen. You know, the way we relate with industry typically is um, if we are not going to enter into some sort of a spin-off or a startup uh, joint venture uh, that is completely different, that then it goes through the intellectual property, goes through the technology commercialization, and then a new entity, business entity uh, gets to be set. But if the corporation, the industry, is going to work with us in terms of funding the basic or applied research that we're doing, uh, the, there are various mechanisms. One of them is the sponsored research agreement. And if most of the work is not done on our premises, our um, overhead is much reduced on their side. But there's even, and I haven't talked about philanthropic because corporations also have philanthropy, obviously. Uh, but I have not talked about that. I talked about um, innovation partnerships, basically. Uh, we've had experiences, and this case was especially with Intel, very interesting. They gave us gift because we are working at such a frontier area for them that uh, in uh, optical, functional optical brain imaging, that they were willing to give us gifts. And in that case, there is no deliverable, but the, uh, what is expected is that they will join with us and work with us. So, so uh, there are various mechanisms of um, finding a way, a transactional way, to accomplish what you want to accomplish. And I'll be happy to talk with you because there's quite an uh, uh, um, array of options. So, Banu, in that regard, how, how often have you seen or what ways have you mitigated the sometimes tension between um, IP? The, the preservation and the mission on one hand of yes. of, of freely that's key uh, the that's of key disseminating yeah. knowledge and the industry's appropriate mission of, of yeah. having that as an asset for for commercial gains yes 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 well that is probably the fundamental question isn't it because we are in the knowledge business in a way knowledge enterprise and we produce intellectual property before it turns into a process, a product, a, uh, some sort of a, um, um, outcome, it doesn't have any commercial value. So there's a very academic uh, responsibility to protect this IP. That's why as soon as uh, we started working with the Coulter Foundation and we beat pretty much everybody, including all the biggies uh, around us, we were the, the only school in the in our region, except for Boston University, uh, we immediately created a full-fledged uh, technology commercialization office where we have obviously uh, our professionals who truly know how to shepherd it through uh, protection. And the protection can happen at various levels. And it, if you know what you're doing, which our group does, you can keep publishing. So it is not such an impediment in, uh, in, uh, in industry uh, academic relationship. If the university knows how to deal with the intellectual property protection, and of course, turning this uh, um, uh, protection, this IP into hopefully uh, with the right approach to uh, Mm, commercialization through a license or maybe through a startup uh, because risk mitigation happens oftentimes with a lot of university in involvement. So yeah, that's very manageable, Danita, very manageable. You're, you're muted, Danita. Sorry. 
I was asking if there's any other questions, and I think I saw. <laughs> I have so, uh, Luis, Padua, and please identify yourself, since many might not know. Hi, Bono. It's Louis Padula. Long time no see. Yeah. Hi there, Louis. How are you? <laughs> you, almost answered, you almost answered my question about on your slide when you showed those universities, sort of three slides before the end, some of them were in red ink and some weren't. For example, Boston University, my old school, was in black. Yes. But yours was in red. There is, because we were endowed, which meant for five years, we received, we each received $1 million to uh, uh, conduct translation research with partners from not only the foundation, but from industry, from economic development agencies. It's a very, it's very interesting. If you're interested in the, the sort of the workings, the logistics, the culture, the community that gets to be created within the university, it puts the dis business discipline within uh, the university. So those of us who truly managed to preserve our academic mission while also producing commercialization outcomes, and it was a very stiff competition. At the end of the five years, we earned the endowment, which meant the money came, the, uh, in this case, the, the total endowment is $20 million, 10 million came from Coulter Foundation to us. So it's in our bank. We could do this forever. So. And, and the schools that did not get the endowment, what did they get? Uh, they, some of them continued uh, on their, with their own resources. Some of them found other benefactors because the, if I hope I have another opportunity well, to maybe be with your students uh, to give them the uh, outcomes because it's very uh, professionally audited program. And um, let me give you some final recent results to you, very, um, you know, broad brush kind of a thing. The total investment from the last I know from the foundation was $75 million to 10. Later on, six schools were added, so 16 schools. Uh, and this is a period of 15 years. First 10 years, it was only 10 schools. And we learned how to, uh, uh, the first excuse me, five years we were 10 schools, then others added. In any case, the outcome is amazing. $75 million by hands on participation in the trenches as the culture change happens by the foundation, the commercial outcome, audited outcome is $5 billion. And for us, that's not what we care about, but that shows that you can have academic institutions participate and become a part of an amazing value creation while you're educating not only your faculty, exposing them to what it takes to bring an idea, a concept to a uh, commercial good, and they change their uh, courses. The curriculum gets affected by this. The students that get experience and, or they go to such classes and get experience, obviously do wonders afterwards. So the impact is so huge, you cannot measure with dollars. But it's five billion today, if it's not more. Uh, it was like several months ago that I checked. So usually at this point, we're, we're reaching sort of our witching hour, so to speak. We really thank you very much again. Yeah. And we would, we would break out for uh, a last chance to uh, hit the uh, refreshment table or the bar. And so what we want to try and experiment here with you is that um, we will just randomly put you into some small groups through Zoom breaks, um, not more than five. Take five minutes if you want. We, uh, I would invite Banu to still hang out in this room because you, you have to active, as many of you already are using this, you have to activate yourself to go. But just give a chance to talk to somebody, particularly those of you who are a little quiet, you haven't met, that's across campus, might be doing something you've never never heard about. Uh, let's just take five minutes. Amazingly how in Zoom world, that, that seems like a long time. And then we can, anytime you can come back uh, or not. And uh, otherwise, I thank you all very much for for joining us today. And thank you, Banu, for, for an incredible- Thank you, Danuta, for the opportunity. I very much enjoyed thank it. Thank you, Banu. Thank you. thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. So thank you. Stacey's gonna send us off if you're interested in doing this. <laughs> Hopefully, if it breaks, uh, well, we'll try it again. So bear with me.
Thanks, Bonnie. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Gail.